Well, hello and welcome to this second episode of Windows into Women's Ministry. My name is Carrie Sandham and I'm the Director of Women's Ministry at the Proclamation Trust in London. In this episode, I want us to think about complementarian ministry. This is not about giving gushing compliments to each other, but rather looking at what the Bible teaches about the roles of men and women in the local church. In a culture that is seeking to eradicate the differences between men and women at every turn, it's vital that we understand, apply, and rejoice in the Bible's teaching on this issue. Complementarians hold together two foundational doctrines. First, that God made men and women equal, equal in status, in dignity, worth, and humanity. And second, that he made them different, not just biologically, and gave them different roles in the family and the church, roles that reflect God's nature and point us to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Being equal and yet different means men and women are complementary entities and together bring completeness to each other. They are individuals in their own right, but together they reflect the image of God in the world, and together they reflect the relationship that Christ has with the church. This complementarity of men and women is a reflection of the equal but different relationships within the Trinity, between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. They are all equally God, but they have different roles in creation and redemption, roles that complement each other. Men and women are equal in creation. Both are made in the image of God. And they are equal in redemption. They are equally ransomed by the blood of Christ and equally marked out by the Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing the same future inheritance. But the role the Spirit has in all of this is not the same as the role of the Son, and neither of them have the same role as the Father. They are equal but different, and men and women are created to reflect this. During his earthly ministry, Jesus was revolutionary in the way that he treated women. Contrary to Jewish practices, he honoured women and treated them as equals. He spoke to them in public and demonstrated his high view of women in the way that he addressed them. He used women as positive illustrations in his teaching and rebuked men for mistreating them and lusting after them. He taught women publicly and privately. He expected them to learn from him and to grow in wisdom and knowledge. He commended Mary for listening to his teaching and he rebuked Martha for being preoccupied with domestic tasks that were simply not as important. Jesus' attitude and behaviour towards women was extraordinary. There is no evidence in the Gospels that he thought women were less valuable than men. He never patronised them or talked down to them. He didn't nag them or make fun of them. He seems to have been totally at ease in their company. He understood them, he valued them, and he treated them well. But Jesus also upheld the complementarity of men and women and understood that they have different roles in the family and the church. That's why he appointed 12 men to be his disciples and commissioned 11 of them to be his apostles. The apostles were also revolutionary in their attitudes to women. Peter understood on the day of Pentecost that the Holy Spirit had been given to both men and women so every believer could bear witness to the Lord Jesus and speak of the mighty works of God. All Christians are equipped by the Word of God and the Spirit of God to speak about the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, so that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord might be saved. The Apostles commended the ministry of women like Lydia and Priscilla and Phoebe, Lois and Eunice, and Paul, writing to Titus on the island of Crete, made it very clear that it was the godly older women in the churches who were to be involved in the teaching, training and discipling of younger women. This doesn't mean just focusing on what it means to be a godly woman, but teaching and encouraging them to bear witness to Christ in their own particular context, teaching their children, witnessing to their family and friends. We all have a part to play in this vital work. The apostles were revolutionary in the way that they valued and encouraged the ministry of women, but they also upheld the complementarity of men and women, appointing men to be elders in the church and encouraging husbands to lead their wives and families. So in marriage, a husband is to submit to Christ, who is his head, 
by loving his wife unconditionally, just as Christ loves the church and gave himself up for her. And a wife is to submit to Christ, who is also her head, by submitting to the leadership of her husband. This is not a recipe for domestic abuse, far from it. Who wouldn't want to submit to someone who loved them unconditionally, who nurtured them and was prepared to die for them? This is the standard of loving leadership that Christ models to us and expects husbands in the family and leaders in the church to adopt. And where men lead in a Christ-like way, women will flourish. Why is it important that we hold on to the equality and complementarity of men and women? Because of our credibility and witness to the watching world. Men and women are created equal by God and together reflect his image in the world. If we don't treat men and women equally, if we don't value them and honour them, then we dishonour the God who made them equal and fail to reflect him accurately. How we treat one another really matters in our homes, our families, our places of work and our churches. We live in a culture that is getting very good at sniffing out inequality and rightly exposes those who demean, mistreat and abuse women. Men and women are created equal, but they have different roles in the family and the church that reflect the relationships within the Trinity and point us to the gospel. If we homogenize the roles of men and women in a family and the church and make them interchangeable, then we end up misrepresenting God and dishonor the relationship between Christ and the church. His sacrificial love and his humble submission to his father is lost. This then distorts our view of marriage, the church, and ultimately our view of God himself. So let's rejoice in these two foundational doctrines, that God made men and women equal, and that he made them different with complementary roles in the family and also in the church. Far from being oppressive, the complementarity of men and women is part of God's design for human flourishing. Thank you very much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again for our next episode of Windows into Women's Ministry.